so I grew up in the suburbs of Atlanta, Georgia. Yeah! All right, another escapee, congratulations. <laughs> and uh, when I was in high school, I was genuinely convinced that the meaning of life was to fit in, to just be liked and be popular and have girlfriends and all that kind of shit. But in my high school, to be in the cool crowd, you had to either be really rich, really good looking, or really good at sports. Now, back then, I was 5'5", five five on my tippy toes, and I wore like really thick glasses and gold rims and way too big for my face. And my family had no money. But I did grow up playing soccer, and I tried out for our high school team every year, and I got cut every year. So high school for me pretty much sucked ass every day until my senior year when I got a job at the soccer kick. Now, the soccer kick, as you might surmise, was our local soccer store. What you don't know is that it was owned by Nick Papadakis, who was this Greek god of a man who played professional soccer for the Atlanta Chiefs. And he was like a local celebrity in Atlanta, and everybody loved the store. So getting to work there was kind of like a little positive shift in my life. I mean, don't get me wrong, I was still a complete loser at school, but now I had a little money and I was making friends at the strip mall. So, yeah, <laughs> that. So it was a pretty good gig until we got robbed. Now, where I grew up, it was like basically white upper class suburban Atlanta. Like there was no real crime to be spoken of or seen, so when the soccer kid got robbed, it was a big deal. And it was a Sunday at six o'clock, and we had just closed the shop, and I was working with this kid named Andy. And Andy could best be described as the love child of Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and Anthony Michael Hall. And so we closed, I let Andy go home right away because he had a soccer match to get to, and that's what you do. And so I'm vacuuming, and I'm closing out the register, and I'm cleaning up, and everything's going along, and I look up, and all of a sudden there's this black guy standing right outside the door and it really startled me. And it's not because he was black, but it's because just a moment ago he wasn't there. And that's just a freaky feeling. And for like the first second when I saw him, I thought that maybe he was Tony. Now, Tony was the strip mall security guard. And he could best be described as what would happen if you put Martin Lawrence and Kevin James in the Hedron Collider and turned it up to an 11. Okay, <clears throat> no science dorks, except Spencer. Thank you, Spencer. But Tony would come into our store all the time and just regale us with his tales of awesomeness. Like one time he told us that he was best friends with Evander Holyfield and he was ringside for the first Mike Tyson fight, and he went over and hit on Robin Gibbons, and she was so turned on that she put her hand on his crotch, which he called his crock. <clears throat> so, pretty much every time Tony came around, I just kind of rolled my eyes, except in that one second, I was really hoping it was him, but no. And now this guy's knocking on the door, and he's asking if he can come in because he needs to buy his son a soccer ball, and my heart's beating really fast, and I'm kind of freaking out, and I don't really know what to do, and my gut is saying, don't fucking let him in, you dumb shit. But he looks okay, and kids do need soccer balls. I mean, it's like, you know, 15 minutes after six, what's the big deal? <clears throat> and so I let him in, and I lock the door behind him, and when I turn around, I'm staring at a gun. And I'd never seen a gun before, but it wasn't one of those like little sissy guns. It looked like really big and, and heavy and solid. And it didn't look like if he pulled the trigger, it would go pew pew. And I don't know how, but I didn't like lose all my shit. <laughs> like I kept it together and I actually got like really zen and really calm. And I thought, well, if I keep him out here, maybe Tony will come and foil this crime. But no. He took me to the back really quickly, and he took me back to the warehouse and put me in the bathroom, and, and he duct taped my hands and my legs and my eyes, which is terrifying. And then he goes out the back service entrance, and I can hear this, like, like this old car just idling back. I'm like, oh my god, this fucking guy really planned this thing out. We're screwed but he didn't tape my arms very well. 
and so I was really able to work them pretty easily. Like I was, I could tell I could probably get him out, and I was doing that. And then he comes back in, but this time with somebody else, and I just freeze. And they're kind of saying shit and fucking with me a little bit. And I'm just praying to God that nobody pulls out a dick right now. <laughs> and then I recognize the second voice. It's Tony. And now I'm getting pissed because I had to listen to months of that piece of shit stories while he was casing my store. So they don't fuck with me anymore and they go and do their robbery thing. And I just like, I guess I was really, really mad because I just went to work on my arms and my arms got loose so fast. I was like, oh shit, I can't turn back now. And so I like grit my teeth and I like, took a big and I was like, oh my god, and it hurt so fucking much. I like started crying immediately. Like just tears that I could not stop, but I had to keep going. And so I like got the tape off of my legs and I ran out the bathroom and I was looking for the phone, but I couldn't find it because fuck. And then I thought I heard them coming, so I run out the back and the car's back there with the but I'm like, no, no, I don't even think about that. I instead climb up these La this ladder that's attached to the building that goes up the one story to the roof. And I guess I was pretty quick because I didn't really hear them come out the back, but I just took off running on the rooftops of these stores and I go to the opposite end of the building, which is basically like the end of this hall. It's really not that far. And I'm just jumping up and down and screaming at the top of my lungs for anybody to like just pay attention to me and call the police. Do you know how hard it is to actually get someone to help you when you desperately need it? You're fucking looking at me like I was a lunatic. Which, in hindsight, I do understand because I was a brown guy in suburban Atlanta with no eyebrows jumping up and down on a building on a Sunday night. But I didn't know what else to do. And so they're just like averting their eyes and walking faster and just avoiding me at all costs. And then I hear the car coming from behind the building. And it's like accelerating, but it's like fuck, man, I can't let Tony get away with this shit. That's, no, no. And I'm looking around, and there's all kinds of shit on top of this roof. I mean, there's like beer bottles and clothes and used condoms and, uh, you know, chairs and just all kinds of stuff, bongs. And I, so I surmise that people had been going up there and partying for quite a while. And if I'd actually stopped for a second, I would have realized that, Man, I'm not even in the cool crowd with the strip mall click. <laughs> but I didn't, and I just start throwing shit off the roof. Like anything I get my hands on, I'm just throwing it down because I'm just so irate. And I grab one of these chairs and I chunk it down there, and it actually like smashes the windshield of the car. And whoever's driving, I hope it's that motherfucker Tony, um, he just like swerves and takes the car through the fence that separates our parking lot from the wooded area, but there's a really deep drop off on the other side of that fence, which I know all too well because in the ninth grade, I popped my beer cherry in those very woods. <laughs> so now the car is like way down there. You can't even see it because there's a creek down there and it's just down there and I'm jumping up and down and celebrating like I had just saved planet Earth from a fucking asteroid or something. <laughs> And when I stop, I can hear police sirens, so somebody did call the police. And I climbed down, and this was a big deal because like news vans and cameras came out. I was interviewed by three reporters. Like for the next couple of weeks, I was big man on campus. Like I couldn't go anywhere without somebody in high school like coming up to me like they were my best friend for life. And I knew that it was fake, and I didn't care because I was a moron in high school. <laughs> and the things that I thought were important to me were just the most idiotic things. But I had wanted this for years, and I wasn't gonna give it up based on stupid principles. <laughs> and before I got robbed at the soccer kick, every day of high school was just mired in depression and misery. So I milked the rest of my senior year for everything I could get. Which is good, because I popped more than my beer cherry <laughs> that time. Oh, and uh, in case you're wondering, Tony was driving that car. 
and his face was all fucked up from the crash. And the other guy got away, but Tony narked him out, and they caught him, and I got to go down to the police station with my mommy and do the whole lineup thing, which is super fucking cool. Thank you guys. <laughs>